so this is the class 2 in the Harrison nephrology series for the MBA exams in this I will be discussing regarding the chapter 3 one, 2 which is the dialysis and treatment of kidney failure so this chapter have covered this following heading like they have regarding the dialysis they have given a short introduction then they have mentioned about hemodialysis what are the indication what is the apparatus goals and complication and regarding the peritoneal analysis and the outcome of end stage renal disease so here i will try to cover it in a sequential steps so that you will understand the subject better and it will be easy for you to cover the harrison once you like go through it in the short introduction they have mentioned regarding the dialysis is the treatment option both for aka and CKD and one of the option for ESRD patient other than the renal transplant and they have mentioned few points about the indication most of the time it is clinical indication laboratory indication this I have discussed in a separate video anyhow I am mentioning the points mostly the uremic symptoms uremic pericarditis encephalopathy coagulopathy gastritis uremic pruritis these are the some of the uremic symptoms or refractory hyperkalemia metabolic acidosis and volume overload these are all the important uh, indication for starting dialysis either an AKA or a CKD patient here they didn't mention the urea gradient cutoff as I told as the urea rises more than 180 creatinine rises more than 6 there is a risk of developing this uremic manifestation and it varies from patient to patient so that is why there is no urea gradient cutoff and after this they have mentioned regarding what is the incidence of this ESRD in developing country developed country most of the places hemodialysis is being used approximately 80 percentage and the remaining peritoneal dialysis now coming to the hemodialysis broadly renal replacement therapy in that dialysis and renal transplant in the dialysis hemodialysis or the peritoneal dialysis under the hemodialysis there are three categories one is intermittent hemodialysis that is intermittently we are giving dialysis for example per week we are giving three days dialysis for three to four hours that is intermittent hemodialysis second is continuous renal replacement therapy it usually uh, done in a severely hemodynamically compromised patient those who are in shock where the dialysis will be ongoing for 24 hours third category is PIRRT what is this called this is also called prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy or slow low efficacy dialysis here the dialysis duration is ranges from 6 to 12 hours and varies so these are the three category of hemodialysis based on the modality and the duration that we give so the hemodialysis can be classified like this and this is the common regimen that we see clinically then regarding the hemodialysis this is the most common modality of dialysis it involves the purification of the blood with the help of diffusion and convection method to understand the hemodialysis better we will divide We will divide the hemodialysis apparatus into four parts. As we see, if we take this as hemodialysis apparatus, first is the dialyzer. Second is the blood circuit. Third is the dialysate circuit. Four is the hemodialysis machine. One by one, I will discuss. First, the concept have to be clear is the basis of this dialysis is the diffusion. One important difference between diffusion and osmosis is here it is the solute molecules move from 
higher concentration to lower concentration. In a CKD patient, the uremic toxins are here. So once we bring a dialysate, the high concentrated uremic toxin will go into the low concentrated area due to diffusion. What is osmosis? Osmosis is nothing but a solvent movement from low to high concentration as we see in the image. So the basis of dialysis diffusion and conduction. So this <coughs> as I discussed the first important component is the dialyzer blood circuit dialysis circuit fourth is the hemodialysis machine. First regarding the dialyzer this is also called as hollow fiber artificial kidney. This is the most important component in the hemodialyzer. So here is the image of the dialyzer. It contains four pores, one for the blood entrance, blood exit. There is the dialysate. Dialysate as of now, remember that as a water. Like entry of dialysate and the exit of dialysis. There will be multiple million micro capillaries inside it micro capillaries inside this blood glows outside there will be dialysate so the diffusion occurs so this is the another image showing the diagrammatic representation how it is inside the dialyzer so the blood comes through the micro capillaries inside it in the surrounding the dialysate or the solution will be revolving around there will be a constant exchange and diffusion occurs over here and this micro capillaries previously it is made up of cellulose and semi-synthetic cellulose currently it is polycellophone biocompatible materials it is made up of so this is the dialyzer where the exchange occurs. The other components are the blood circuit to deliver blood to the dialyzer. Then this side the solution circuit or the dialysate circuit or are managed by the manual worker which is the hemodialysis machine. And what are the other details I have mentioned is the membrane character. The inside we have seen the micro capillaries. It have its own character which adjusts the clearance. Usually it is made up of polycellophone. This have its particular character which adjusts to the molecular weight of the solutes to be removed. Efficiency, ultra filtered coefficient. But at least for the medicine resident, this microcapillary is made up of polycellophone. This characteristic varies based on the characteristic. The clearance can be adjusted, the ultra filtered can be adjusted. And how the ultra filtered? What is this ultra filtered? Ultra filtrate is nothing but <coughs> water removal from the patient. How we are as the blood goes through the dialyzer inside, if it is a positive pressure in the dialysate side, there will be negative pressure. So the water moves from here to here. So ultra filtrate basically removes probably the negative pressure, and this characteristic can also be adjusted based on the dialysis par parameters. This is how much ml of fluid can be removed for how much mm of pressure. Some dialysis removed less ml, some dialysis removed more ml. <coughs> and then ideally these dialysers are have to be used only once after that it have to be discarded. But sometimes we can reuse it. How to reuse it? The sterile and which is used is formaldehyde previously, paracetic acid are being used in the sterilization procedure so the dialyzer can be reprocessed. This detail is also mentioned in this chapter. <coughs> Coming to the second important component, the blood circuit. What is this? To take the blood from the patient to the dialyzer which is located in the hemodialysis machine we need a tubing system and to take out the blood from the patient vein we need catheter or fistula this entire thing is called the blood circuit 
are the important points related to this blood circuit? In a CKD patient, the atriovenous fistula is the most preferred vascular access to take out the blood for the dialysis machine. In the AK patient, the dialysis catheter can be used. What is the rate at which blood have to flow? Blood flow ranges from 190 to 300. But in the dialysis, they have mentioned approximately 250 to 400. This is what the ml per minute. At this rate, the blood have to come out. The most of the time, AV fistula, the cannulation near the size is 15 gauge. What is this atriovenous fistula? It is nothing but the connection between the artery and the vein. The most common site is the radiocephalic fistula, radiocephalic fistula or PC fistula. PC is the, here is the radiocephalic fistula. Here the artery gives more blood flow in the vein. There will be remodeling occur in the vein. So this area we can use for dialysis. So radiocephalic fistula or brachiocephalic fistula. This is the preferred site. And since based on multiple studies, they have found out for a CKD patient, this is the ideal vascular access. So they have made it as fistula first initiative. It is nothing but they have uh, like there are guidelines which says we have to start the dialysis for a CKD patient through fistula that increases the mortality and morbidity rate in the CKD patient. Then what are the other option catheters can be used which can be tunneled or simple catheter. Tunneled catheter is also called as the permacath. What is this permacath? These are the dialysis catheters being placed in the large vein especially internal jugular vein or the femoral vein. Femoral vein, the time duration is ideally up to 72 hours. After that, you have to remove because there is a risk of DVT. IJV is the preferred, light IJV can be preferred. There are two types of catheters, permacat or the tunneled catheter. What is the, in the image, we are seeing the permacat. Here is the vein entry site. After that, there will be subcutaneous tunnel and the catheter exits through this site. There are two sites, one is to receive the blood, sorry, one to deliver the blood to the dialyzer, one to receive it. Suppose if the catheter is size is small and it comes directly out like this, then it is a simple catheter. And one more point I want to mention over here, here is, many medicine residents have the doubt, since the blood through which the port through which the blood goes into the hemodialysis machine in the usual language they will say as arterial line so they will be thinking the catheter is placed in the artery no the catheter is placed in the vein only only the nomenclature is called as the arterial line because blood is delivered to the dialyzer so that is why it is at least for the nomenclature it is told uh, mentioned as arterial line it goes to the dialyzer then back then it is called the venous line so the one receives it, one supplies it, but both are placed in the same way. Many times medicine first year students will be having this doubt. See both are placed in the same way. So regarding the fistula, I told the important point regarding the catheter, permacat and the simple catheter. Simple catheter can be kept for six weeks. Permacat, there is no specific duration. The side effect of it is there is a chance of infection with it, catheter related bloodstream infection. Third option is arteriovenous graft. In a patient where AV fistula can't be made directly, there will be some prosthetic materials can be kept between artery and vein. Subsequently, can be used for dialysis. So basically the preferred is the AV fistula. Next coming to the third important component, dialysate circuit. What is this? So we have seen the dialyzer. Blood is coming through blood circuit. But for the diffusion to occur, there should be something in the opposite side which have to circulate. So this thing which is circulating in the opposite direction is called a dialysate. 
what is it made up of suppose if we keep simple water what happened there will be lot of hemolysis we have to equilibrate the contents so what it should have since blood have lot of electrolyte dialysate should have electrolyte since the ckd patients are mostly metabolic acidotic patient it should have bicarbonate and it should have lot of water so these are all the three important common part a contains the electrolyte part b is bicarbonate and third is the water these three will be mixed inside the machine and the final dialysate is formed and delivered so what are the important points with the with the respect to this each component so this is schematic diagram just to we have seen regarding the dialyzer blood circuit from the patient one is coming out going to the dialyzer then returning to the patient this side which we are circulating is the dialysate so this is the hemodialysis machine here there will be dialyzer from the patient blood will be coming so this machine there are wires to second the part a second the part b and our water will be supplied from the back these three three will be combined inside the machine and machine will be delivering the dialysate to the dialyzer so that the diffusion occurs the important points that have been mentioned in part a is since part a contain lot of electrolyte the sodium composition is varies from 135 to 145 milli equivalent and one thing they have mentioned is regarding the sodium modeling what is this because inside the dialyzer there will be diffusion between the blood and the dialysate suppose if we keep a higher concentration of sodium here sodium here from here it goes back here as per diffusion if the patient is hypotensive <coughs> the sodium composition of the dialysate can be kept higher at the beginning of the dialysis later it can be reduced to lower level so that the patient equilibrium will be attained because in an average four hour dialysis the initial part can be kept high the later part can be kept low so that the diffusion and the hemodynamic status of the patient can be understood what is the potassium level it is usually 2 to 4 mill equivalent previously potassium free the potassium current of the dialysis used to be 0 to 1 but those were currently not recommended because if we use this there is a gross changes in the potassium level or shift in the potassium level in the patient body which leads to increased mortality so that's why currently the potassium component is 2 to 4 in Harrison they strap the dialysate with this contents only so that's why I made it at a sequential details and it contains calcium calcium also level can be adjusted from 1.2 to 1.75 other thing that it contains glucose also 25 gram or glucose free can also available so the dialysis on an average flows at the rate double the blood flow so inside the dialyzer the blood flow will be for example if it is 250 the dialysis will be approximately 500 ml per minute if blood and the dialysate flows in the same direction inside the dialysate it is called as co-current dialysis if it flows under the opposite direction it is called as counter current dialysis so these details might not be required for the medicine resident at least it is important to mention over here uh, because in the subsequent discussion these kind of uh, words are being used and what is this RO water we can't use the normal drinking tap water for this dialysis because it is going to be coming direct contact with the blood so this have to be free of bacteria endotoxin ions chloride have to be removed so that's why deionization uv radiation the electrolyte composition have to be totally free for this RO water so the RO water undergoes lot of treatment before entering the machine how much water is required because most of the dialysate content is mainly RO water because the ratio of part A part B to water is for example you can remember as 1 is to 1 is to 34 so most of the thing is water if it is close at 500 ml per minute what happens to 30 minutes 
sorry 60 minutes approximately 333 ml that is 30 liter so uh, for an 4 hour dialysis approximately the patient needs 120 liter this line is directly given in harrison and this is the explanation so the RO water requirement is being changed as per the dialysate flow rate so fourth important component is the hd machine it is like a manual worker the important thing is the dialyzer the dialyzer will be attached over here dialyzer from the patient from the patient there will be a blood supply that goes back to the patient and there will be dialysate supply there will be part A can part B can from the RO water all three get mixed up so through the tubing the dialysate will be supplied and what are the important components of this machine first is the monitor on the working panel here is the blood pump through which it sucks in the blood from the patient and delivers into the dialyzer and push it back and it has lot of monitor to detect the blood leak and we can adjust the ultra filter how much water to be removed from the patient what is the blood flow rate dialysate flow rate if there is any disconnection from the catheter the machine will give the alarm what is the pressure is there any damage to the dialyzer if there is any clotting this machine will give the alarm it can regulate the temperature of the dialysate the alarms will blow off whenever there is a any abnormality in the dialysis process whenever there is a dust circuit disconnection or if there is a clotting the alarm will go off go on so this is the kind of hemodialysis machine so this is one image i have kept to show the hemodialysis machine in our unit this scan contains part A, this scan contains part B, there will be wires which suck in and uh, here the dialyzer will be connected once the patient comes it will be connected, the dialysate supply and dialysate will be received back here so this is all regarding the hemodialysis apparatus which we have seen one by one dialyzer blood circuit dialysate circuit and the hemodialysis machine so this is what the image given in the Harrison so suppose someone sees this image directly at least they will get totally confused name is the arterial line but the blood comes from the vein only it goes directly to the dialyzer inside the dialyzer the blood moves on and goes to the patient on the outer side there will be dialysate dialysate will become the composite of RO plus part A and part B here they are mentioned like this water treatment, reverse osmosis electrolyte contents the bicarbonate contents so once you understand the concept and see this image you will get a better idea suppose if we see it directly you will get a lot of confusion what are the goals of the dialysis there will be correction of hyperkalemia volume overload usually get settled down and how to monitor this it is based on one formula which is the urea reduction ratio it is nothing but pre dialysis urea minus post dialysis urea by pre dialysis urea basically they are saying how much urea is being reduced it have to be 65 to 75 percentage another important parameter to monitor is kt by v it is nothing but a formula to direct the clearance k is the clearance time v is the volume of distribution it need another 20 minutes to explain how this formula comes but at least for the PG level just remember the KT by V have to be more than 1.2 and the patient's uremic symptom should improve and an average ESRD patient might require 9 to 12 hours of dialysis per week
and in Harrison they have mentioned regarding the few trials where they have compared in nocturnal dialysis, home dialysis and uh, frequent dialysis versus less frequent dialysis what is the uh, advantage and disadvantage grossly there is no overall uh, advantage of one modality of increasing number over other it varies from patient to patient and the clearance being monitored by urea reduction ratio and kt by v this will be enough and what are the complications which can occur during dialysis is most common is hypotension there are various factors which can contribute it is one is excessive water removal or the ultra filtrate removal the effect of drugs uremic toxins the reactions so one important point to note is the ultra excessive ultra filtrate removal so how to stop it a uf removal of more than 30 ml per kg per minute is associated with risk of hypotension on an average 600 ml sorry 13 ml per kg per hour so ultra filtration should not be removed more than approximately 600 ml per hour and it varies from patient to patient and it is one of the theoretical point whenever a patient develops hypotension during dialysis what to do we have to stop the ultra filtrate around 200 to 300 ml ms can be given if the patient is chronically uh, in hypotensive state yeah alpha agonist drug like midotrin can be considered this is for ckd patient but uh, before that we have to find out why the patient is having hypotensive episodes other common side effect is the cramps it is because of the excessive ultra filtrate the muscle perfusion goes down so the patient develops severe pain in the legs this is more common in the dialysis unit many a patient complains severe cramp, crawling sensation in the lower limbs. Another important point with respect to MCQ is the dialyzer reaction. This might be like asked as a 10 more question in final exam theory. What is this dialyzer reaction? There are two types of dialyzer reaction. Dialyzer reaction A and B. Why I have made this dialyzer reaction A common in the beginning of the dialysis. It is because of the IgE mediated reaction secondary to the ethylene oxide which is present in the dialyzer which is used in the initial disinfection process during the manufacturing of the dialysis. And it is a very severe type of reaction. What is the treatment? We have to stop the dialysis. Give epinephrine or steroids might be required. Type B is a minor reaction compared to type A. It is because of the complement mediated reactions and the dialysis can be continued because it occurs in the later part and usually it dissolves without any serious consequence but type A is very dangerous. So those were the points covered in Harrison with respect to the hemodialysis. Now we will see regarding the peritoneal dialysis. The important points are peritoneal dialysis it is also one form of the renal replacement therapy here the peritoneal membrane itself acts as a semi-permeable membrane almost the concepts are similar to the hemodialysis only instead of the dialysate here the pd fluid also called as peritoneal dialysate fluid will be inserted into the abdomen the semi-permeable membrane is the peritoneal membrane blood inside the capillaries there will be diffusion because of the osmotic difference there will be dragging of the fluid to the peritoneal cavity and it will be drained back diffusion i showed in the initial image what is convection convection is nothing but along the flow the molecule will be cleared out so because of the osmotic drag water will be from the capillary to the peritoneal cavity along with that the molecules will be dragged off it is the convection and the ultra filtrate and clearance can be adjusted ultra filtrate can be adjusted as per the fluid we are putting inside the abdomen and the clearance as per the 
patient peritoneal membrane characteristic the clearance is being determined as we see here this is the peritoneal fluid getting connected to the peritoneal catheter entering into the peritoneal cavity then after keeping it for three to four hours it can be drained off so if the person does it manually it's called as one nomenclature is being given without the cycler if it is done it's an ambulatory peritoneal dialysis if an automated machine does it there will be a machine which pushes the peritoneal fluid into the abdominal cavity it itself sucks it back after some time these are called the cyclers so it can be done manually or using the cyclers how much fluid we have to put inside on an average 1.5 to 3 inches to vary from patient to patient so similar to hemodialysis here also types are there for peritoneal dialysis first the continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis if it is being done manually patients take the bag connect it to the stand put it inside the abdomen keep it for three hours and drains it back this is continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis because the patient can walk around after putting it inside the abdomen the other one is the automated peritoneal dialysis it is based on the cycler the cycle will do it automatically we have to just press the buttons so it will do the number of cycle and all it will manage accordingly it is subclassified into continuous cyclical peritoneal dialysis tidal peritoneal dialysis or the hybrid approach the cycler will be used in the day in the night the manual thing means that is hybrid approach what is tidal in the tidal peritoneal dialysis we won't be removing the entire fluid some amount of peritoneal fluid will be kept inside and it will be done like this so these are all the types why i mentioned here because in harrison they have mentioned regarding only these two they didn't mention why it is being classified this peritoneal dialysis catheter is made up of usually silicon and it contains anyway there will be a lot of small pores from which the peritoneal fluid goes into the peritoneal cavity and it also form a subcutaneous tunnel here there will be two cups which is made up of dacron so that it keep the catheter in situ this is the entry site this area is called the tunnel and it goes into the peritoneal cavity from the midpoint there are varied designs of the catheter straight catheters are there coiled catheters are there important point i want to mention is there will be cups outside the intraabdominal portion of the catheter subcutaneously it forms the adherence and it is made up of dacron cup and the catheter is made up of silicon and these are the types of peritoneal dialysis catheter another important point that i have mentioned here is the peritoneal equilibrium test here many a residents will have the doubt what is it since in hemodialysis i have told that dialyzer micro capillary characters can be varied similarly all humans are not same the peritoneal membrane characteristic might also different so what they have did they will assess the dialysate glucose level and creatinine level and compare with the plasma creatinine level and the glucose level based on this they found out how fast they are transporting the glucose and the creatinine some patient transported at very fast some at a lower pace and a few were average level so these details are not required for the medicine resident at least they should know they have classified the peritoneal membrane of the individual based on this characteristic and subsequently they have categorized into four groups high high average low average and low what is the advantage of this because this will be helpful in selecting the regimen for example high transporter high transporter means the osmosis between the peritoneal fluid and the blood occurs very fast so the transport occurs very fast from the peritoneal cavity to the blood so if we keep glucose it will get absorbed very fast so if glucose is not there the osmotic movement of water into the peritoneal cavity won't occur 
So what happens? So we have to put the fluid inside, keep it for a short duration and take it out. Because if you keep it for a longer time, everything will get absorbed inside the body. So it will cause harm to the patient. So in case a high transporter, you have to do a fast cycle, rapid cycles are required. So better to use a cycler, better to select an APD regimen, automated peritoneal dialysis regimen. Suppose if it is a slow, uh, slow transporter, he absorbs it slowly, so you can give a free APD type, manual type of dialysis, peritoneal dialysis can be selected. So in draws, just remember this transporter selection will help to decide the regimen of peritoneal dialysis. This is what the concept is. And how to check the clearance? The most important thing is the patient symptoms. Usually peritoneal dialysis is preferred in the CKD patient. Between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, there is no gross difference except for the technical aspects, affordability. The infection rate mortality is similar. And it can both can be used in IEK, both can be used in CKD. Most of the time, uh, in CKD patient, PD is being used. If PD is used, how to assess the clearance based on the patient symptoms? We can look at the patient anemia response, IPTS level, symptom, uremic symptom, how it is, how is the nutrition, overall well-being of the patient. Here also, KTYP can be used. What is this? This is nothing but how K is the clearance, T is the time, V is the volume of distribution. Just remember this formula is for assessing the clearance of the dialysis and ideally it have to be more than 1.2 in case of hemodialysis 1.7 this point is not being mentioned Harrison that they have mentioned regarding few study Adimax study and the conclusion of the study is the mortality doesn't change with increasing the KT by V but the overall symptom uh, can be used as a marker of the clearance of this peritone dialysis and based on this study they have made the KT by V cutoff for a peritone dialysis patient how to calculate this is not important for the MD medicine residents I will make a separate video for the MDM residents how to make a how to calculate this KT by V what are these peritoneal fluids this comes in bag this also contain electrolytes and bicarbonate and the bag strength usually from 1.5 to 3 liter the glucose the dextrose is being used as the osmotic agent so that it drags the fluid into the peritoneal cavity and from the peritoneal cavity it gets absorbed through the lymphatics and also through the peritoneal membrane other than the dextrose ecodextrin a metabolite of starch can also be used is being used and what are the other add-ons which can be used is the heparin can be given to avoid the clots insulin they have mentioned in Harrison but uh, in practical purpose it is not being used because it causes peritoneal membrane sclerosis antibiotics can be given if there is a infection or if the patient develops infection what are the complications in this peritoneal dialysis most common is the peritonitis how to detect this patient you have pain fever cloudy white colored drying fluid how to diagnose more than 100 cells out of which more than 50 percent is polymorphs that means patient have a pd peritonitis and they have mentioned what is the most common organism the skin organism staph aureus or the organism which got migrated from the colon these are the most common organism when to remove the patient didn't respond or if there is a serious infection fungal infection pseudomonas they have mentioned it fungal infection tubercular or if there is a tunnel site infection tunnel i have showed you there is a subcutaneous tunnel if it is get infected better to remove it or if it is the exit site infection exit site tunnel site less than two centimeter around the exit site of the catheter is called exit site infection more than 2 cm is the tunnel site infection for exit site infection topical antibiotics are required sometimes IV antibiotic might be required and how to manage this IV antibiotics 
preferred site is initially intraperitoneal if there is no response then IV antibiotic tunnel infections are common peritoneal cancer patients are more prone for protein loss malnutrition can occur because dextrose is used as being used as a peritoneal dialysate fluid not only dextrose can be electrolyte bicarbonate also composition I didn't go in detail in case for gross understanding since it contains dextrose as a risk of hyperglycemia hyperglyceridemia but what is the only advantage is the patient since the peritoneal dialysis occurs almost 24 hours if the if the patient regimen is planned like this or most of the time of the day like most of the time the patient will be on three cycle for four hours each morning he will be putting after and he will be putting evening he will be putting draining the fluid after three four hours since the patient diet is occurring almost daily the patient can have a liberal diet since the electrolytes is getting stabilized so these are the complications that you have mentioned and the last paragraph they have mentioned about the outcome and with respect to the ESRD patient the most common cause of death is the cardiovascular uh, mortality and the usual cardioprotective measures have to be imp uh, imp uh, implied in these patients also like RAS inhibitor, BP control, sugar control other complication, other, uh, complication these patients can develop is impaired coordination, priority, protein energy malnutrition, more prone for infection this is the outcome of the ESRD patient not Hemodialysis of the peritone dialysis patient. And they have mentioned regarding the global perspective. So, this chapter is small. Once you understand the concept, as you mentioned over here, this will be easy to cover it up in the Harrison because the information is little bit jumbled. Thank you. See you in the next chapter.